Thank you very much. I hope you like the title. It's all Anil Malotra's idea. <laughs> now, I didn't go away to make an entry. I just realized that I was worried about everyone else's slides and I hadn't checked my slides and I use a Mac. So if there are any inconsistencies, please forgive me. So uh, what we'll examine over the next 10 minutes is how do we differentiate between athlete's heart and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I suppose most of you know more about that as compared to the dilated cavities that you've heard already. The importance of distinguishing the two entities, what's the gray zone, how do we approach the differentiating process, and also mention some of the challenges. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a condition that the individual gets unexplained hypertrophy, and it can be associated with myocardial disarray, prominent fibrosis, as well as small vessel disease. And in clinical practice, it can manifest with band or features such as very asymmetric hypertrophy that you can see in those MRI images, a left ventricle outflow tract obstruction due to the thickening of the ventricle and also the systolic anterior motion of your mitral valve, diastolic dysfunction, as well as diffuse subendocardial ischemia. And how to detect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? We're actually pretty good at that because ECG is a quite a sensitive tool. And here you can see a band door ECG with deep T wave inversions in almost every lead, including ST segment depression, apart from the voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. And here on the echocardiogram, you can see an extremely thick septum compared to the posterior wall with some systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, and I'm pretty sure that he also has a left ventricular outflow gradient. But the point here is that not all hypertrophic cardiomyopathies will be that Pandora. And this is a study that has just been published on Nine at the Heart by my colleague, Dr. Nabil Seik. And he looked at a large population of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, black and white. The only thing I will highlight that if you look at the pattern of hypertrophy and you concentrate at the bottom of the table, you will see that some individuals will have concentric more in the black cohort, about 10%. And also, some will have the apical pattern, and that's important because it doesn't reflect athlete's heart, but it can be challenging to identify, particularly during echocardiography. And depending on what study you look at, you may have up to 30% of HCM cohort that have a symmetric or concentric pattern. If we look at the other side of the coin, you already heard that exercise induces several cardiac adaptations, and in one of those adaptations will be a thickening of the left ventricle. And we also know that uh, the more pronounced effect is in adult male athletes large body surface area who compete at endurance sport. And as has already been mentioned, there is a pronounced effect of black ethnicity with black athletes exhibiting significantly more left ventricular hypertrophy compared to white counterparts. And exactly the same factors will influence the presence of repolarization anomalies on your athlete's ECG. And a proportion of that will overlap with the repolarization abnormalities, in particular T wave inversions, that are very common findings in cardiomyopathies, and in particular hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, our gray zone will be predominantly athletic individuals who have a wall thickness over 12 millimeters and up to 16 millimeters, and I'll explain to you in a second why 16 millimeters, and those athletic individuals who have repolarization anomalies, and obviously the more challenging ones will be the ones who combine both features. It has already been alluded that particularly for cardiomyopathies and for the most challenging cases, you will have to be very methodical about it. So you have to go from history to physical examination and then start from the simple investigations and go down your scale. You don't necessarily have to do all of them, but you have to consider most of them and how each investigation will add to your clinical diagnosis in differentiating physiology from pathology. So let's talk about the 12 lead ECG. I've got here from you some pretty band or ECGs. So you can see features such as deep T wave inversions, particularly in the inferolateral leads, 
T-wave inversions in the lateral leads are malignant or sinister until proven otherwise. And that's a very important point because even if your investigations are negative initially, if your athlete has deep T-wave inversions in the lateral leads, you will need to follow them up on a regular basis. Other features highlighted here is the pathological Q-waves. And if we go through our list, lateral T-wave inversions, ST segment depression, as you can see here, pathological Q-waves, and I've added left bundle branch block as well, are not features of athletic adaptation and should be investigated comprehensively. Now, remember we said about black athletic individuals, they exhibit more hypertrophy but also more repolarization changes. And this is the classic ECG of black athletic individual where you see those deep T-wave inversions in the anterior leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, and those are usually associated with J-point elevation as well as a convex ST segment, but they do not extend in the inferior or lateral leads. So lateral T-wave inversion in any athletic individual should be viewed with caution. Now, if we go to the role of transthoracic echocardiography, I won't go through all the features because if it's a band or case, then everyone will recognize it. But the things we need to determine is usually the magnitude of the left ventricular hypertrophy, the pattern of left ventricular hypertrophy, which in athletic individuals should always be symmetric. Maybe there'll be a difference of about two millimeters, but that should be it. And obviously, keep and or make a comparison between the degree of hypertrophy as well as the left ventricular cavity size to ensure that your left ventricular hypertrophy is not at the expense of your left ventricular cavity size. So these histograms are quite old now, but this is a study we performed. This is on male and female athletes. The black columns are black athletes. The gray columns are the white athletes. And the only point I wanted to make that if we take a cutoff of 12 millimeters, then almost 12% of black athletes will exceed that cutoff and overlap with a mild phenotype of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus only 1.5% of the white athletes. And in female athletes, you will very rarely see a white female athlete with a wall thickness more than 11 millimeters, irrespective of what sport, how much, and what's her size. But occasionally, black female athletes can go up to 13 millimeters. So if, in terms of absolute value, a wall thickness of more than 16 millimeter in any male athlete and 13 millimeter in any female athlete should again suggest underlying cardiac pathology. And we've got two echocardiograms. One is of an athletic individual with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and one is of an athletic individual with my left ventricular hypertrophy. Both of them have a left ventricular wall thickness of about 13 millimeters. But the point here is that one has a cavity of 40 compared to the other one who has an end diastolic dimension of 56. <coughs> and if you try and do your relative wall thickness, you can do it in a number of ways by adding, for example, the thickness of your septum compared to the posterior wall or taking an average of several measurements and divide it with your left ventricular end diastolic cavity in our first individual with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it comes as 0.68, and that's HCM. In the second individual, it comes as 0.45, and that's more likely to represent athletic activity. So the message is that if you've got a relatively low thickness of more than 0.45, and definitely above 0.5, then think about pathology compared to physiology. I will just briefly show you that table of diastolic and systolic indices. Those are the common ones that anyone could be using. There are obviously other things that we can do with transthoracic echocardiogram, but that's on a more research basis rather than clinical practice. And the message I've got for you here regarding diastolic and systolic indices, that if abnormal, they suggest pathology, so they do have a high specificity, but if normal, they do not exclude pathology because they've got a very low sensitivity. <laughs> 
What about the role of exercise testing? I won't expand in that too much, but this is a study that Professor Sharma performed back in 2000, 60 ye 16 years, not 60 years ago. <laughs> uh, he's not that old. And essentially what he did, and that was a pioneering study at that point because we're still trying to do exactly the same in 2016. So he looked at a cohort of hypertrophic cardiomyopathies with mild LVH and athletic individuals who had left ventricular hypertrophy as well. And those are the values he gave regarding the peak VO2 in absolute terms and predicted in differentiating physiological from pathological uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So those are the values that we have adopted and obviously in your exercise test, if you see ventricular tachycardia or if you see a blood pressure response, then you've got your answer. What about the role of cardiac MRI? Cardiac MRI has been used extensively. It has a role in differentiating physiology from pathology within the context of left ventricular hypertrophy. But the thing I wanted to highlight, which is one of the big advantages of cardiac MRI, apart from delineating the pattern of left ventricular hypertrophy, you can see a nice example of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy here, is to look for the presence of potential fibrosis, the late gadolinium <coughs> enhancement. And late gadolinium enhancement is not a normal feature of athletic adaptation, particularly in young athletic individuals. Regarding the role of genetics, they can be extremely useful because they can be positive in up to 80% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the only point I will make is don't try to be smart. Do your clinical evaluation first and utilize your genetics as the clinical evaluation dictates. So it may be sometimes for diagnostic purposes, but predominantly for cascade screening, and always get a multidisciplinary approach. You need your geneticists to interpret complicated results. So genetics is not usually a yes or no answer. Briefly about the training, if someone has hypertrophy or ECG changes, and they detrain for four to eight weeks, and everything, regret, uh, sorry, everything persists, then that's a sign of pathology. If everything regresses, then that's considered a an, an sign of physiology, but I will add some caution because you can have exercise that brings out the phenotype of underlying cardiac disease, both on your ECG and your transthoracic echocardiogram. So you can have someone with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who develops ECG changes that regress on the training. So be cautious about that. Now, before I finish, I just want to highlight the challenges of identifying athletic individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a really nice study that was published last year, and I will invite you to go and read it in detail. It's nice because we did two things. The first one, we took athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most people before that have been comparing sedentary HCM compared to athletic individuals and compare them to sedentary HCM patients to see the effect of exercise on the phenotype. The second thing is we took those in the gray zone. So those athletes with HCM who had my left ventricular hypertrophy and compare them to a cohort of athletes with physiological LVH. And I'll make just three points. The first point is if you look at the distribution of the pattern of hypertrophy, you will see that in athletes almost 50% had either concentric or an apical form which means that you've got a greater challenge compared to the 13% in your sedentary population. The second point, so if you've got that sort of ECG, which is highly suggestive of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, do extensive investigations. If your echo is normal, then just proceed to a cardiac MRI. The second point to make is that because they're athletic, they tend to have more dilated cavities than what our thinking is about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there was a group of athletic individuals who had HCM, but they had dilated cavities at the same time. And the final point I'll make is that if you look at those indices of the diastolic function, you will see if you compare sedentary HCM to athletes with left ventricular hypertrophy, they seem to perform reasonably well, particularly that septa Lee prime of less than nine. But if you actually look at athletes with HCM compared to athletes with LVH, most of them, they're 
well, almost useless in that their sensitivity is very low, but their specificity remains high. So the gray zone in athletic individuals is actually greater than the one we previously thought. And I'll just finish and I'll leave you with that histogram which just highlights the main points of my lecture regarding the interpretation of the ECG, echocardiogram, exercise test, MRI, and regression with detraining. Thank you very much for your attention.